Anyway, we've got it. Good. Okay, so everybody can see uh, this slide and uh, uh, away we go. So um, the, the title's a kind of catchy. It's America's Nazi Cruiser, and that'll become clear as we go along with what that is all about. Uh, we're talking about the USS uh, Prince Eugen. Now, uh, for, for all of us uh, English speakers, it, it looks like Eugene without the E at the end. Uh, the pronunciation in German, as I understand it, is uh, Prince Eugen. And uh, a couple of things I'd just like to mention. Uh, the, the ship itself is referred to as the lucky ship, and we'll see why as we go through this presentation. But in terms of uh, preliminary comments, uh, despite the fact that my surname is German, I am not German, <laughs> and I don't speak German. Uh, in fact, my dad was a uh, World War to a war veteran um, on the Canadian side of uh, things, so on the Allied side. Um, and uh, so if some of my pronunciation is way off, uh, maybe uh, John, who uh, John uh, German, who I believe does speak uh, German, can correct me, but uh, I'll, do my, I'll do my best. Um, the uh, acknowledgements, I'd like to acknowledge Steve Shea for all, uh, I've, I've only been with the USCS for uh, a uh, few years and just been amazed by Steve's presentations, which have really sort of got me into the into the hobby or the you know the USCS uh, aspect of the hobby. Uh, Lori also for uh, the chair work that she does uh, and everything uh, through the year, um, and she's been very uh, supportive of uh, people uh, like myself uh, doing their first presentation to USCS, and also Dick Kaiser. I don't think Dick is on. Uh, the call, but uh, Dick, who I guess most of you would know uh, and runs a shop outside uh, Seattle, uh, provided me with uh, uh, a number of uh, documents related to Prince Eugen, uh, which I believe he obtained from Lori, and they were all part of David uh, Bernstein's collection, to whom I'd like to dedicate uh, this presentation. Uh, I never had the opportunity to meet uh, David, but uh, saw a number of his presentations and recognizing that some of what I have in here uh, came from Dave and Laurie. I believe it's fitting that uh, it be dedicated to him. Um, and also I'd like to welcome Jim Moses. Uh, I understand that Jim is a uh, Annapolis grad and uh, is quite familiar with the Prince Eugen. I recently wrote an article in uh, Naval History Magazine about the bell uh, of the Prince Eugen. And uh, I'm sure Jim can uh, provide us with some uh, thoughts uh, when we uh, when we get to the uh, commentary afterwards so with those as preliminary comments uh, here we go um it the prince oigan was also referred to as a ubiquitous ship it's almost like a forest gump uh it showed up everywhere uh, <laughs> and uh and yet it survived uh, so you 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 wonder how uh, but it was a lucky ship um uh, that that's uh ended up in the Atlantic, the Pacific, Germany, France, uh, and uh, the United States. Uh, it was everywhere during the short period of the Second World War. Uh, so I've sort of divided the presentation into three categories. Uh, it's service in Germany, uh, service in the U.S., and uh, what became of it uh, in uh, Bimini Atoll. Um, and also there's a little addendum about Jimmy Doolittle, which uh, uh, I'll, I'll explain as we go or at the end. That, uh, by the way, is the, uh, of course, the uh, sailor's uh, tally from the sailor's cap of the Prince Eugen. Uh, and and the, the first word uh, is cruiser. So cruiser, Prince Eugen, and that was the tally on, on the sailor's cap. So a uh, Craig Marine, a uh, Craig's Marine, a uh, ship Prince Eugen, uh, much like a USS, it was a KMS uh, Prince Eugen. And um, just beginning with the, the name uh, Prince Eugen, uh, this is actually a letter from uh, the American uh, skipper uh, who we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, it's actually signed Speed Gobart and uh, you'll understand why in a little bit. But uh, the reason this slide is here is to explain that the name Prince Eugen, um, that was not originally going to be the name of the ship. Uh, when the keel was laid, it was named uh, differently, Lutzo. 
And uh, after uh, Hitler ordered um, an essentially alliance with Austria, they renamed the ship to the Prince Eugen to please the Austrians because Prince Eugen, if you go back in history, a couple of hundred years was a field marshal uh, for the, um, uh, the Austrian empire. And uh, he was really a, a hero of Austria and uh, uh, sort of uh, well-known in the court in Vienna. Anyway, it became the Prince Eugen. And uh, it was a heavy cruiser. Uh, Kiel was laid in 1936 as uh, Germany was preparing for war. It was launched in 1938. And uh, the picture here, actually the postcard here, is just after the launch. Um, and you see, of course, the banner Prince Eugen. Um, and uh, that building in the background is the tower of the Hotel de Ville, the city hall uh, in uh, Kiel, uh, where the, the big Krupp shipyard was. And uh, the uh, Prince Eugen was uh, commissioned uh, two years later in 1940. So this is an interesting uh, cover. It's, it's more than a cover. It's actually a booklet. Um, there's a front back and an uh, interior to this booklet, uh, but what appears at the bottom of the front is, is, a, uh, is a cover uh, stamped, as you can tell. Um, you, one, one stamp that appears on virtually all covers uh, involving the Prince Eugen is in fact the Nazi eagle, which you see there. And um, this is actually an anniversary cover of 50 years uh, later uh, after the launch. Uh, but there is a picture of the Prince Eugen at the time uh, it was completed and going into service. And uh, this one is franked in, uh, in, in Kiel, uh, as I say, 50 years after the actual launch. Uh, this in German is on the, the back of, the, uh, of that booklet, and it essentially provides the, uh, the statistics on the ship I'm not going to go through it, obviously, in any detail, uh, simply to say that uh, this was the sh third uh, cruiser in the Admiral Hipper class of heavy cruisers. And these heavy cruisers um, would sort of be in the middle of the American heavy cruisers in terms of uh, size, uh, just under 700 feet, displaced 18,000 plus uh, tons, a potential crew or space for 1,800 officers and men. Uh, and uh, a top speed of 32 knots uh, with a range of something like 6,100 nautical miles at, uh, at 15 knots. So it was a very efficient uh, fighting ship of its day. And uh, it was really uh, the, the German Navy, the Kriegmarine was uh, very proud to have uh, the Prince Eugen uh, come down the, the slip. This is a cutaway of the uh, of Prince Eugen a few years later, uh, but you can see uh, that it, you know its uh, its uh, size um, and uh, just an impressive ship. It actually was we don't see it on the the bottom drawing from above, uh, but there was actually a Nazi a swastika on the very front on the bow, uh, just in front of the first uh, gun placement. Um, and that swastika was kind of unique to the Prince Eugen and allowed uh, the uh, British uh, aircraft uh, in that area to actually identify the Prince Eugen quite easily when they, when they saw it running. So in terms of weapons, uh, eight eight inch guns, four turrets, uh, 4.1 guns, 37 millimeters, 20 millimeters. It had three seaplanes with twin floats and it had these unique uh, torpedo tubes on each side. And, and what we're gonna find with the Prince Eugen is it was really state of the art engineering. And we all know the Germans and their engineering, uh, they tend to be extremely good at it um, to the point that uh, there were a number of innovations in this ship that were really unknown uh, to the allied forces at the time. And a lot of uh, the machinery and even weapons uh, were, um, unfamiliar to, to the Allied forces and how to operate them, which became relevant as, as, we, as we go along here. So it was a very uh, well-armed uh, uh, cruiser. 
And there it is uh, flying the swastika as you see at the very bow, uh, bow flag. And uh, 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 very imp impressive ship with an impressive array of uh, radar and uh, other uh, electronics. So the, the first, um, the Prince of Wigan uh, became well known uh, for a couple of incidents during the, uh, the Second World War. And the first was that it was really, it ran with the Bismarck. And uh, it joined the Bismarck in 41 in Norway, and it, it broke out uh, uh, into the, uh, the North Sea uh, with uh, the Bismarck in order to uh, raid commerce on, in the Atlantic. Uh, which uh, quickly led in May of 41 to the uh, battle, what's referred to as the Battle of the Denmark Strait, which is when the hood was sunk. And, and uh, I, actually, I, I'm hoping that Jim uh, Moses will uh, tell us a little bit about that, uh, maybe in, in the, uh, when we, a little later on, because he's got some interesting insights into, into the contribution of the uh, Eugen in terms of the sinking of the hood. But in many ways, it was a foil for the Bismarck. Uh, the Prince Eugen was there to really uh, protect the Bismarck as best it could. But we all know that eventually the Bismarck was sunk. However, the Eugen um, escaped. And uh, so as I put, as I indicate there, uh, once lucky, uh, and it becomes lucky again. But again, in this, this is a, a picture, uh, an artist depiction of, of the Bismarck. Now, this is the, the second uh, incident which has sort of gone down in history uh, with respect to the Prince Eugen. Um, what's referred to as the Channel Dash. The Eugen and uh, the Skarnhorst and the Gnesino, uh were in, along with a number of destroyers, were in Brest, France for repairs. Of course, France was under Nazi control in those years. Uh, it was in Brest uh, for repairs. But the Brits knew it was there and the bombing and started bombing Brest and, and bombing the ships. In February 42, Hitler himself ordered that the ships uh, return to Germany. And uh, they either take the long route uh, via the Atlantic or they run up the English Channel. And the decision was made to run up the English Channel, which was a highly uh, dangerous route to take, obviously. Uh, anyone that's been in England, you, you know that you can see the continent from uh, from England. It, it, so you don't, there's not much room to play with. And uh, the decision was made uh, to take the channel, and that became the Channel Dash to try to make it uh, to Norway and then into Germany uh, without being detected. Well, sure enough, they were detected, and um, the uh, British Coastal Command started uh, bombing uh, the uh, the vessels as soon as they could, but with surprisingly little in the way of results. Um, as the, the ships got uh, further north and, and approached Norway, uh, the Eugen was torpedoed by the HMS Trident, the submarine. And uh, it suffered uh, a blow to the stern. And what you will see, if you look at the Eugen picture here, which is um, a a, a photo, a reconnaissance photo taken by the British Coastal Command, you will see that the stern has actually been cut off, squared off and in, in the back, uh, about uh, 30 feet are gone from the stern of the ship and that's where it was torpedoed. So they were able to uh, effect repairs um, sort of on the run in a channel in Norway and continue uh, their, their dash uh, to Germany. So that's where I say it was uh, twice lucky. Uh, so this was really a, you know, an, an incredible uh, feat on the part of the Germans to actually make it back to Germany uh, with their with their ships. And, and the reason of, that Hitler wanted them back was, well, one, they were getting bombed in France, but also uh, he feared a an invasion in Norway uh, by uh, Allied forces in 1942. And and as we know. Uh, uh, Dunkirk occurred and it wasn't in Norway, but uh, he feared that there would be an invasion in Norway and he wanted the ships closer to home. And this is another picture from a newspaper of, uh, uh, it, it's very hard to, to tell, but this is uh, apparently the Eugen uh, with her uh, uh, destroyers uh, near at hand and uh, with a, a screen, a smoke screen uh, on that run uh, home to Germany. 
uh, interestingly, along the way, um, near Norway, uh, the, the Brits really, uh, in addition to the, the problem, the, the stern uh, uh, damage, uh, the, the Brits uh, sent a number of bombers, torpedo bombers and other bombers uh, uh, after, the, after the ships. And uh, one of the uh, RAF bombers uh, crashed in the water and you see it there on the left. And sure enough, if you look to the right, there's the, there's the pilots. Uh, I, I think one is covered by our photographs uh, on our, th those of you that are on the call, but there's actually, to the right, there's actually another RAF uh, 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 pilot. And you see one with his hand up against his cheek. Um, they were uh, taken as prisoners and they were very lucky guys uh, that the, uh, that they were, uh, they were rescued and uh, they were taken off the ship in, in Kiel when it finally arrived back in Germany. This is a, a model made many years later. Uh, there have been many models of the uh, Prince Eugen. This was a, obviously a, a beautifully crafted model of what the Eugen looked like at, uh, prior to its bombing uh, in 1942. Uh, very impressive uh, uh, ship. So um, after it made it to Germany, uh, the Eugen ended up uh, providing fire support uh, for uh, German uh, troops, um, bombarding Russian positions and allowing uh, the Germans to make a, uh, a hasty retreat. Um, it it did, really didn't see much uh, more action other than training and fire support uh, until 1945 when it sailed to Copenhagen, and that was it. Uh, it was uh, surrendered to the British, and it became the largest surface combatant of the German Navy. Uh, to be turned over uh, to the Allied forces. Uh, and in fact, there were not too many uh, large surface ships left, uh, but it was, it was one and it was relatively intact. So that leads us uh, to part two, uh, when it becomes the USS Prince Eugen. And this is actually a document. Um, it's uh, signed by the German captain uh, but you'll see that it is both uh, in English and in Dutch. And uh, it refers to the fact that uh, a particular seaman is still employed, but he's now employed by the Royal Navy uh, instead of the Kleg Marine. In other words, uh, the British took control of the ship in Copenhagen and relied on the German crew to get it to Bremerhaven. And, uh, and, and, uh, this document simply indicates that uh, uh, the, this individual is, is still a seaman, uh, despite the fact that uh, Germany has surrendered. But as with many gifts, uh, the Eugen was re-gifted. The Brits really didn't want it. And they were quick to offer it uh, to the United States, which really didn't want it either. Uh, but there was a division, a, a divvying up of the various uh, German sur surface combatants. And as we all know, at the end of the war, you know, the United States and all the Allied forces were actually decreasing uh, their ships. Uh, they were trying to reduce their fleet numbers. Uh, vessels that were in production uh, were, you know, sort of left uh, half built. And um, in you know, the, the fleets uh, decreased in size uh, somewhat dramatically. So really they weren't looking for more ships, but uh, what to do with the Germans um, other than scuttle them uh, was, you know, take them on. And that's what happened with the Prince Eugen. So the Brits uh, moved the ship over uh, to the Americans. And uh, there you are with the ship in Bremerhaven and uh, the, the, the United States had to decide what to do. So, uh, a decision was made to uh, bring it to the United States. Uh, it was, as uh, Jim mentioned, uh, given a miscellaneous identification number, IX300. And um, the next problem was, well, who's going to get it to the United States? Uh, and the decision was to keep the German crew or the majority of the German crew because the, the engineering was so unique that you really needed the Germans to run the thing. And that's what happened. But you had a both an, an, an American and a German captain. So there were co-captains, the 
the U.S. captain obviously had overall command, uh, but the existing German captain continued. Not, the Germans were all considered to be prisoners of war, but uh, they were sailing the ship and a small contingent of uh, U.S. Uh, sailors came aboard. So off they went to America, arriving in Boston Harbor in uh, January 20, on January 23, 1946. And uh, uh, the arrival in Boston Harbor was somewhat uh, contentious. Uh, the newspapers were wondering, much like the question earlier uh, this afternoon, what's a Nazi ship doing in our harbor? Uh, and then it was explained it was a war prize and uh, it didn't stay in Boston too long. So um, going back to postal cancels, uh, this is a, uh, another letter of, of some interest. It's written many years later by Captain uh, Grobart, again, the American captain. And it's to a gentleman by the name of D.H. Clausen. And uh, Clausen was a crew member of the Prince Eugen, but he became a collector. And I believe that I obtained uh, some well, my, my original Prince Eugen documents at an auction, but I believe there were Clausen's documents. And it took me a while to figure out the source of the, the material that I had received. I, and I should just add that I got into Prince Eugen quite by happenstance. I, I purchased a, a, a bunch of documents and uh, cards at an auction, and there was a little uh, uh, three ring binder in there. And uh, it was this Prince Eugen, which I knew nothing about at the time. And I suspect that was uh, Clausen's uh, uh, binder, and it was probably his collection that I bought without knowing it. So uh, you'll see that uh, there was there's mention by the captain at the time. Captain Grobart says there was a U.S. Navy post cancel on board, and there was a special stamped envelope uh, from Bikini. We'll talk about that in a minute. Stamped on the date of the atomic drop, uh, and then he refers to where this might be. Um, there's been a lot of mystery over the photos taken of the Prince Eugen. Uh, they, many photos appeared uh, something like 40 years after the fact. It appears that a crew member uh, had taken possession of most photographs and they were, they were not seen for many, many years. But now uh, there are a lot. This is an interesting uh, cache of the Eugen. Uh, you see the, the Nazi eagle. Uh, it's dated June uh, 30th, and I believe that's 1946. Um, and it's it's a photo that's been turned into a, an artist's uh, depiction, a drawing. Um, and it's 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 a very difficult to to see this one in detail, but you do see the same two stamps showing up: the Eugen stamp with the the uh, the Nazi eagle, as well as the uh, uh, Prince Eugen. Uh, Kriegsmarine, so uh, the German uh, Navy uh, stamp that's placed on most of these, these cards. There are the two captains, and this is sort of a story within a story. Um, to the left, obviously, the U.S. Navy captain, uh, Grobart, and, and to the right, uh, his uh, co-captain, uh, the German captain. And uh, I have a little bit of a summary of their lives. Grobart was a fascinating guy. I believe Jim Moses in his article refers to him as colorful, and that, that's a good way of describing him. They were both born about the same time, uh, same age. Uh, Grobart actually joined the Marine Corps at age, uh, well, prior to whatever the age was at the time. I think he was 16, and uh, two days later, they found out uh, that he was too young, so he was not allowed uh, to go on to, to uh, training, uh, but as soon as actually, I, I, I think he was early, younger than 16. When he turned 16, uh, he joined the Navy and he eventually ended up in Annapolis uh, and uh, was uh, Annapolis 1925 grad. Now there's an interesting story about him at Annapolis. Um, he was not much of a runner. He wasn't really an athlete. And you can sort of see from his picture, he's a fairly heavy set guy, jocular type fellow. Um, he, uh, his, uh, the U.S. Navy Acad Naval Academy was in a, in a track and field competition, and one of their, uh, one, one of the members of the team dropped out due to an injury or sickness, and so they persuaded Grobart to run uh, in the track and field competition, but of course, he wasn't much of a runner, 
So he ended up a full lap uh, or half a lap behind the entire uh, race. Uh, he, he was the last man standing, so to speak. But it, as a result of that, they were able to continue in the competition and uh, they weren't kicked out. Uh, so by at least appearing and running the lap, uh, the, the Annapolis team was able to continue. And from that point forward, he was called Speedy because obviously he wasn't Speedy, but that became his nickname. And he ends up signing everything, Speed Grobar. He took that name on with, with relish. Uh, most of his service was as a submariner, and uh, then he became an na assistant naval attache in Germany. Interestingly, his family was German, but he also picked up Russian, and he was fluent in both German and Russian. Uh, after the war broke out, he was arrested by the Gestapo, and uh, he ended up, uh, he had a lot of friends in the Clegg Marine uh, who uh, lobbied for his release uh, from custody. And he was uh, eventually sent back to the United States in a prisoner of war swamp. Um, and uh, he continued in uh, as a submariner. And, um, and then uh, after the war uh, was sent over to Germany again because of his language skills and he became the chief of US Naval Intelligence in Germany. Um, and uh, he, he lobbied uh, to take command of the Prince Eugen. Uh, despite the fact that he had never really uh, skippered a ship of that size, he was an underwater guy, um, and uh, he was given uh, command of it. Uh, and years later, uh, he went back to Germany and worked for the CIA in a couple of uh, offices in Germany. And he was very uh, involved in the creation of the new German Navy, because after the war, of course, the Russian threat presented itself immediately and the United States and the allied, uh, allied countries were anxious to get Germany up to speed again so that uh, there would be a buffer uh, to, to the Russian menace. And uh, later, Grobart moved to uh, uh, Germany and became a, a very successful uh, engineering consultant, made a lot of money, and then retired to Palm Beach, stayed in touch with his German friends. He died in 2003. Uh, without going into great length, uh, his co-captain, Reinke, uh, he got along great with Reinke. Uh, they had a wonderful, it sounds like they had a wonderful trip over to uh, Boston. Um, he, he was obviously a, a German uh, by birth uh, and a career uh, sailor. And he had been involved in planning for the invasion of England, which of course never occurred. He was present uh, during the Channel Dash uh, that I described earlier, where the Eugen uh, went through the channel, but he was on a different ship. And uh, he was given, um, he was actually also uh, in Hitler's bunker when Hitler made the decision to, uh, that, the, that they should take that channel dash. Uh, he became a POW, obviously, after the war. But as a POW, he was the co-captain of the Prince Eugen. He died in 1978, and Grobart uh, spoke at his funeral. So it's really a testament to the fact that despite we're two warring uh, partner, two warring countries, um, these uh, seamen were able to uh, see past that, and they became very close friends, uh, it would appear. This is just a picture of uh, U.S. Navy, Navy folks on board uh, swabbing the decks. And uh, we got a couple of covers here. Now, these are all uh, covers 40 years after the fact, but this particular cover shows the arrival shortly after the arrival in Boston, and you see a reporter from Boston radio station interviewing two members of the, the captain, who's a fellow with the uh, pipe uh, in, in sort of the, the right of the three um, officers. There's a U.S. Naval officer standing behind them, and the radar officers on the left, and they're trying to explain what Prince Eugen is doing in Boston. And uh, because there was a headline, Nazi vessel in Boston, and you can just imagine uh, the uproar that that could cause. This cover appears to have been sent by the radar officer to himself, um, and it's, uh, it's dated uh, 40 years after the fact, as I indicated, 1986 in Boston. And there is the, the, nave, the radar officer that you see in the earlier picture on the left-hand side. Um, there's an actual photo of him. and then. 
it's uh, embedded as a cachet in, in the cover. Uh, again, 1986. Uh, and I do not know his last name. And I've actually spoken to a German speaker and looked at it and we, we can't make it out, but I'm sure with a little research, we'd be able to find out who the radar officer was. I've got other photos of crewmen, but again, uh, no names. And there's another picture. In this case, the lieutenant, the U.S. Navy lieutenant is not present. You got the radar officer, Captain Grobart, and the radio announcer. Um, and it's again taken. Uh, and, and this one actually, interestingly, um, is franked nine days after the earlier two, and it was sent to Captain Grobart in Palm Beach. Uh, so you can see that there was this close connection uh, between Grobart and former officers from uh, the uh, Prince Eugen. And here's a couple of other covers uh, that were sent on the 40th anniversary of the arrival in Boston. Um, and uh, the one to the left is addressed to Detlef Clausen, whose collection I believe I purchased. And they, it has both US and uh, German postage on it, uh, Frank in uh, Boston. And um, at the second circle uh, actually refers to comrades of the cruiser Prince Eugen. Uh, and the one on the right is identical, although it is addressed to Captain Grobart again, and also to his executive officer. Uh, and uh, it, it has, again, German and U.S. Okay. Uh, postage, uh, although a different uh, uh, 25, uh, I don't know if, what that would be, marks, I guess, uh, okay. stamp. Okay, um, so from Boston, the uh, the ship moves on to Philadelphia, and uh, this is actually uh, kind of an interesting silhouette view. As you can see, the the shadow, um, you see the silhouette of the of the Oigan, um, and uh, it goes off to the Philadelphia Navy Yard. You'll see on the bottom right hand corner, uh, March nineteen forty six. I believe this is just as it's it's probably. Uh, leaving, I think, the Navy Yard, because what happened in Philadelphia is, is interesting. Um, a number of uh, uh, items were taken off the ship. Um, the United States was really interested in some of the engineering, uh, the uh, guns, sonar, and so forth. And I think, again, Jim Moses uh, is the expert on this. But a number of items were taken off the ship uh, for closer inspection uh, at the Navy Yard. But that's not all that happened at the Navy Yard. Um, the first wave came aboard. And, uh, you know, there has to be a, uh, a lovely woman in every story. And uh, sure enough, here are two uh, seamen uh, from the Prince Eugen, two U.S. Uh, sailors with, uh, with the wave, uh, Joan Mortimer, who apparently was the uh, first American girl to set foot on the Nazi warship. And they called her Miss Spellbound. Uh, so, uh, quite popular to see her on board. And there's a little description of the ship and uh, the fact that it was already referred to as the lucky ship. And interestingly, behind uh, the three people in the photograph is the bell. That's the ship's bell. And the ship's bell uh, is really the centerpiece of Jim's article in Naval History Magazine about what to do with the bell, because as I understand it, that bell is is sitting in the United States right now and uh, um, and has been. So uh, there's the uh, the Nazi eagle uh, on on the bell. So uh, in Philadelphia, as I said, a lot of things uh, were going on. This is a letter from uh, Speed Grobart, the captain, and you can see how he he signs it. Speed. He's still thinking back to his track days in Annapolis, and uh, he sends it to Clausen, the collector, uh, who was also a former crew member. And he's referring to the fact that he's going to attend a reunion of the crew. And they did have a reunion uh, 40 years after the fact in, in July 1986 uh, in Germany. And of course, Grobart was back and forth between the United States and Germany, although by this point, he's getting much older. Um, and he's, the purpose of this letter is also to clarify some information with respect to the seaplane. 
And although that's not terribly relevant to what we're talking about, it goes to the point that when in Philly, uh, the true purpose of the Philly visit appears to have been uh, to really examine the ship and pull off those items of weaponry and uh, engineering items that would be of interest to the United States uh, for purposes of uh, research and development. And here he does mention at the very bottom of the letter that um, one of the seaplanes was removed and, and taken to the Naval Air Station in Willow Grove. So uh, presumably uh, that plane was, was also taken uh, out for, uh, to be examined, I suppose. And there's lots of correspondence um, dealing with the administrative side of things. This is a piece of correspondence that allows uh, the wearing of naval uniform. Um, uh, while th this one uh, refers to the Brits, but it's also signed by uh, a United States officer. Uh, but but what happened is the German crew were allowed to wear their uniforms, including the officers, but without medals. So they couldn't wear any medals, but they could wear their uniforms. And we all and after arriving in the United States, a number of the crew were released and allowed to go home to Germany. And they were given reference letters indicating, you know, thanking them for their continued service, that they're no longer on obligation. Um, and, and so forth. So um, after Philadelphia, the ship goes through the canal and ends up in Pearl Harbor, uh, May 10th, 1946. And uh, you have uh, two, again, anniversary uh, covers here. The one on the left, uh, postmarked 40 years later in Honolulu, addressed to a, a colonel in the Marine Corps. Uh, that same camaraderie stamp from the, the Eugen Free Soldiers Mail. And the one on the right is addressed to Captain Grobart again. And, uh, well, sorry, not addressed to him, it's signed by him. Um, and uh, same date uh, in, uh, in Honolulu. Uh, and a lot of the signatures on various things uh, by Grobart uh, were actually um, requested by Clausen, uh, the, the collector. He, he, was, he sent a lot of covers out for signatures and Grobart was very accommodating. And here are, here's a copy of the ship's orders uh, in German, uh, 30th of March, 1946, indicating what's, what's going to happen. And it's, it's sort of a detailed rundown on when the crew, what portion of the crew will be released, where they will be released, where they will stay until they are returned to Germany. And there was a staggered return of the German crew. Um, and this is, this is really cute. This is a program that was uh, developed. And when you open the program, it lists a series of activities. Uh, many of them involving tugs of war and physical challenge uh, challenges. Uh, it was a competition. So what you have here is the USS Braxton, uh, an attack transport. The crew of the USS Braxton uh, took on the crew of the Prince Eugen. And I'm assuming that that is both the American and the German crew of the Eugen. And uh, they had a friendly uh, field day, uh, as people used to do before television. And uh, uh, they competed in a number of different uh, uh, sports. And it uh, sounds like they had uh, a great day. But uh, that is not the end of the story. The Prince Eugen, the reason it went to the Pacific was because it was headed to Bikini Atoll. And uh, here we have uh, the uh, nuclear uh, or the atomic bomb tests in Bikini. So the idea was the, I should just back up a bit. Um, the, the orders, the decision was made that the United States really had no further use after Philadelphia for the Oigan. Um, it had taken off the ship what it needed. Um, and uh, in the general spirit of demobilization, it was one of uh, many ships selected uh, for destruction in the Bikini Atoll uh, atom bomb tests. So. It was taken to the Pacific. Uh, they, the crew had their farewell party, and then off it went. And unfortunately, uh, again, the engineering 
either was uh, too complex uh, without the German crew on board. Uh, most of them had been released in California and sent home or in, in Hawaii um, that uh, the U.S. essentially uh, towed uh, the Eugen uh, most of the way to Bikini Atoll. And um, then we have two atom bomb tests. Uh, there was a ghost fleet, as most of you are probably familiar, 70 ships. Uh, Able blast was an air drop. Baker was an undersea blast. And here you go again. The Prince Eugen survived both. So despite two atomic bombs, uh, all that happened was a broken main mast. And, uh, but it became, as they described it, frightfully radioactive. And about a year later, it was to towed to another atoll, and uh, shortly thereafter, it capsized. Now, interestingly, prior to the atomic blasts, and in today's day and age, we wouldn't think of doing this, but in those, at that time, the decision was made to see what the impact of an atomic bomb would be on a fleet of ships. And the decision was made to fuel up the ships prior to the blast so that you would know uh, the impact on a ship full of fuel. Well, uh, now we've got a capsized Prince Eugen uh, in a South Pacific atoll, and it's full of fuel. And uh, in 1973, the United States uh, identified this as a significant problem uh, because of leakages. And uh, sure enough, uh, you've got. Uh, I'll just skip ahead here to this picture. Um, there is the Prince Eugen uh, capsized. It's got two propellers uh, that are projecting out of the water as well as its rudder. A third project pro propeller, three, did I say projector? I meant propeller. Third propeller had already been removed and, and is actually in a museum in Germany. And there are two uh, American ships that are uh, taking the oil out of the uh, Prince Eugen. And that is as recent as I think 2018, 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the oil tanks were uh, near, uh, because it's capsized, uh, it was easy to get at most of the oil tanks uh, on the underside of the ship. And um, so they've tapped into the, uh, the hull and they're, they're, they're bringing the oil out. Now I'll just go back again uh to yeah so the uss salvor and a tanker by the name of humber were doing the removal there so these are a couple of covers that i took off the uh, naval uh cover uh, museum uh they're not in my collection uh but uh, just to give you a couple of examples of uh covers from 1946 themselves i had that one earlier which with the uh artist depiction of the Eugen. But here are a couple more. Um, and uh, the reason for these, uh, June 30, 1946, appears to be the last day that the Eugen was in service because July 1st was the able uh, atom bomb. So the following day, it was the bomb went off. So you've got June 30, 1946, again, uh, franked, um, and it's described in the Naval. Uh, cover museum as a low C2 RTZ and a low C2 Z. Um, you've got the Nazi Eagle, you've got the camaraderie uh, stamp. And uh, uh, then you've got this one. And it's also franked on June 30th, but it's already got a picture of a bomb test. Well, the bomb didn't go off until the following day. Uh, and of course, there weren't planes flying around when the bomb went off. So, uh, although one was an airdrop, um, one can only assume that this was a, a stamp placed on uh, before the bomb uh, went off or a stamp placed after. Um, and uh, I, I, I don't know which, but of course, you've also got the, the Nazi Eagle and the camaraderie stamp. And uh, it is dated June 30th with a rubber stamp that it would appear cache of uh, the following day, <laughs> the test that went on the following day. And um, then we've got a, I've got a couple other caches. Um, 
I, I'm, I'm sure Steve Shea probably knows the history of all of this, but one is referred to on the back as Bikini Cache Number no. 4 by Dilhoff. Uh, it's franked uh, 40 years later in the Marshall Islands um, and uh, 1986. So a little over 40 years after the, uh, the blast. And sure enough, it's addressed or it's, it's signed uh, again by Grobart. So I suspect, again, uh, Clausen, the collector, sent it to Grobart for signature. And uh, this is another cover uh, from the Marshall Islands. Um, it's described as cache number five by Dilhoff. Uh, what's it, this is actually depicts an ID card for Operation Crossroads. And it, it's really not related to the Oigan. It's, it's of a, uh, uh, another ship, the Oniota, which was a... Uh, Mine, uh, a mine, or a, was it a mine sweeper? Or it was a small utility uh, ship. Um, and this third one is, is an interesting one. Uh, it appears to be a, a joke cachet, but I don't know the joke. And I'd be really interested if someone does know the joke. Uh, again, it's it, this one actually does commemorate the 40th anniversary of the blast, July 1st. Uh, 90, 1986. And what you see here is uh, Minsk, Blinsk, and Bloops uh, written on the cachet. And it, it says a distinguished gentleman from the Soviet Union was left on the Prince Eugen. So I, I don't think anyone was left on the Prince Eugen uh, when it was blown up. But there has to be a joke behind this. And of course, uh, Russia was already in the crosshairs back in those days. Um, so I, I don't know. There's that uh, photo that I showed earlier. And that is essentially the end of the Oigan. Uh, it foundered in that lagoon uh, from December 21st, 1946 onward. Uh, interestingly, among the war prizes, there were also war prizes from uh, the Pacific War. And the United States also obtained the Japanese battleship Nagato and the cruiser Sakawa. Um, they were also sunk in Bikini Atoll, but they did not, they never received U.S. Navy numbers. Uh, and uh, so they were under U.S. control. There were war prizes, but they do not have numbers like uh, the Oigan did. And I, I, I don't know why. Well, speed it up about uh, 40 years, uh, as we have been doing with those anniversaries. And here is the current day Prince Eugen. It's a passenger ferry that uh, you can find up in the upper Danube uh, River. And uh, this is a postcard from it. And it's addressed to uh, the collector, Mr. Clausen. And I just don't recall who is sending it to him, but obviously a, a crew member. Um, and it's franked in Austria. Um, so the Prince Eugen lives on uh, in, in a completely different form uh, than it did before as a warship. Now, just a little addendum to this presentation. Uh, when I received this collection way back when, um, not knowing very much or anything about the Eugen, um, I, I also found. Uh, various covers, including one signed by Jimmy Doolittle. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, what's the connection? The only connection that I'm aware of right now is it's the same collector, uh, this crew member from the Prince Eugen, Clausen, whose name shows up in this presentation a number of times, uh, seems also to have collected covers from Doolittle's uh, bombing raid uh, over Tokyo. Uh, but there is a connection more than that, and I haven't quite figured out what the connection is, because there's actually a letter, uh, I don't have the letter here, but there is a letter from a uh, woman uh, uh, to Clausen explaining how she is looking for certain ship's covers, and uh, it seems like there is a connection, uh, but, but I don't know what it is. So just a little, uh, this was part of the... Uh, what I received, just a little news article. We all know about uh, the Doolittle Raid. Um, oh, here's the letter. Actually, it is in here, signed by Martha. Uh, to dear Detlef, I hope you will be pleased with the enclosed cards you sent me. 
There are five cards that Clausen sent to her, and she seems to have arranged for signatures. So I don't know who Mrs. Martin is, um, but obviously related to Doolittle's Raiders. Um, and uh, she plans to write to the government printing office about the other ship cards. So it's a bit of a mystery what that was all about. Uh, and just for interest's sake, um, because we are talking Navy as opposed to Air Force, but here is the cover with uh, Doolittle's uh, signature. And uh, then we have, uh, this is uh, a fellow by the name of uh, Paul. He was a gunner. And uh, York, uh, who was a pilot, uh, he ended up uh, landing in Russia. And we have Lawson, who was actually captured. He's the author of uh, 30 Seconds Over Tokyo. Uh, he lost a leg. And this gentleman, Mr. White, was the flight surgeon who, who cut his leg off for him uh, to save his life um, and allowed him to go on to write that book, 30 Seconds Over Tokyo. So uh, the Doolittle Raid, which has absolutely nothing to do with the Prince Eugen, but obviously a collector somewhere along the way uh, was aware of a connection. And uh, it's one of the many mysteries of, of collecting, I suppose. And... Uh, just as I've found with the Prince Eugen story, there is so much to it uh, and so many different layers. And I guess in, in conclusion, um, what you really see here is the coming together of ship's crew, uh, two ship's crews, uh, American and German, right after the war. They appear to have got along very well together. The captains became fast friends. And it talks about, you know, the strength of, uh, you know, the human human condition and uh and also of uh, seamen uh sticking together and uh, you know common interests uh the war was over and they put that behind them and away they went but you also saw that humanity in that they picked up the 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 Eugen crew actually picked up the british uh airmen uh who had been bombing the Eugen in norway so there's some really interesting uh, uh, stories uh, ideas, human emotions that run through this entire story. And that is it. So I've taken up a fair bit of time. I hope you enjoyed it.